Hey folks, we're uh, on a small river in Alabama today. I got Russ Snyder's with me, fresh off a win on Eufaula, and I got Mr. Tim Perkins back there. And uh, we're <laughs> we're gonna we're using our motors. We're actually a really good game plan for if there's a small river that you're gonna go fish and you've never been there before, find a dam on it, find the first bridge downstream from that and then motor up to the dam. That's what we're doing today. It puts you on unpressured water uh, because people don't like to do float trips where they have to do a dam portage. So we're gonna do that today and uh, in a little bit tomorrow. We're two days out here. And um, I got some interview questions for Russ. So let's get up to this dam and we'll catch some fish on the way. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's mash it. Hey Russ, is your... Uh... You're working at Eddie. Tell me, tell me about your season so far. The wins you've had and where you're standing in the uh, AOI Angler of the Year race for uh, for each of the series you're fishing. All right, yeah, I, uh, the season's obviously been going good. I've been doing all three circuits: uh, Bassmaster, KBF, and the Hobie. Uh, started off down in Florida for the KBF and got a win there. Um, got a win in all th all three actually. Uh, did a, a few of the Hobies, but I uh, got a win in Broken Bow uh, for the Hobies, and um, yesterday was my second Bassmaster event, and um, down there at Eufaula in Alabama, and got a win there as well. So got three wins and one in each circuit, and uh, sitting on top of uh, Angler of the Year right now for for KBF and Hobie. Um, so so far so good. Uh, it's probably my favorite time of year to, to fish, the springtime. Uh, so hopefully, you know, I can keep some of this momentum going and uh, finish the year strong. We'll see how it goes. Pretty good on. You get one? Yeah. Buzz baiting? Buzz bait. Nice, man. Big old 3 8 ounce. Black red with a gold blade. Sweet. It's hard to beat. Oh, it's cold. Contact. All right. We're going to better go. There's buzz bait right here. It's, it's sounding right. I, I build my own buzz baits, and it's weird though how, you know, I'll build them with the exact same components, and some of them have a nice sound and nice squeak like this one does, and uh, you know, other ones don't. So uh, there's other tricks you can do, you know, to try to make them squeak, and it seems to, you know, the more you use them, the more they kind of wear in. One thing that sucks though is like right when they're sounding just as good as they can get. It's usually when it's that little uh, rivet there is just about all the way worn out and when they end up breaking on you. But this one here, it's got that sound. So this is where all the sound from the buzz bait comes. It's from this little piece here rubbing against this rivet. And as well as like that hole right there basically from the, the wire kind of wearing out that hole. And the more that that hole gets worn out, uh, the better it seems to, to squeak. But at some point, it'll eventually become too brittle and break. But you make your own. I make my own, so yeah, if that happens. I've used one buzz bait before, and uh, I think I used one for almost an entire year last year. I went through like four blades before finally the arm breaks. Uh, I get these, I get like a super extra thick arm right here, uh, just because unlike a spinner bait where you might want a thin arm, a buzz bait doesn't really matter. You're not getting that vibration like you would from a spinner bait, so I just get it made with a really thick wire, um, and eventually these are the things that wear out right here. It's got a nice sound though. This one's got a good bubble trail going too. That's another thing I like. Actually, I'll build one exactly the same as this, and it just isn't, and it isn't the same. That's all. Especially about that noise, but when it does a good bubble trail like that, that's also a good thing. And for it to ride straight, you don't want that blade, you don't want it running over on its side, and that's just a balance of you know, whatever the weight of the head is compared to the size blade. Uh, if you use too big a blade, what's gonna happen is that head's gonna start rolling over to its side like that. So you really wanna balance blade with the head. Awesome. Get over here. Got 
gotcha. <laughs> Dang, that was cool. Right on that weed point right there. Slurped it. All right, 20 incher on the buzz bait. They just started. Let's see if we can get a few more. All right, we're gonna start diving into the uh, interview questions here. Uh, Tim has us uh, cruising through some of this kind of slower water. We want to yeah. find a little more current. So we'll cruise up and um, I'm gonna jump in and say, talk about a decision you made in a tournament to, to change course from what you're doing that paid off big. You know, whether it's leaving an area or tying on a completely different lure or presentation any any story that that kind of matches that um, I mean I guess what I'm, I'm going for is is decision-making processes and and looking it, back on a decision that was that ended up being good because I think we all have in a tournament decisions where we spin out and are yeah. bad yeah there's always like a plan I mean I always go into tournaments with like a plan a B and C and sometimes I scrap all of that and just go fish new water new techniques just um, you know conditions change so a lot of times whatever you find pre-fishing even if you have a plan a b and c you know if conditions drastically change it'll get to a point where none of that's really working and give me just, an example of of uh, you went into a tournament yeah, uh, and you had a okay, game plan uh, chattanooga or the chickamauga so the lake chickamauga tournament the bass master uh, last year was in the fall uh, fish were really nomadic roaming and uh, you know I was finding them on small swim baits and uh, you know a number of other things I had some offshore stuff and um, it gave it a few hours none of it was working uh, I wasn't catching fish so you know I got to a, to a point where I so said let's do something let's do something different um, when I was pre-fishing it was windy every day and then it was uh, during tournament it was slack calm so what I ended up doing is going over to a marina and fishing uh, you know boat slips in the marina pretty much uh, just yo-yoing a lipless crankbait off the bottom. It was fall, uh, you know, they're feeding on shad. And, you know, it was a good example of uh, just doing something completely different. You know, I didn't pre-fish any of that. It was a lure. I didn't fish pre-fishing, an area I didn't fish pre-fishing. Uh, and it ended up, you know, almost paying off. I got four fish, still got a check. It was a really tough bite. Uh, all I needed was, was one more fish. Uh, it would have put me in either first or second. But uh, still, that was, you know, a decision I made that... Um, you know, pretty much scrapped everything I had pre-fishing and uh, just went to new water, tried new technique. Let's talk about conditions. Keep keep going with your motor. We're gonna we're gonna okay. cover a little bit of ground as we go. Um, <clears throat> what what conditions do you think are the most critical in terms of making the uh, you know making that adjustment, making a, a change in what you're doing? What do you you mentioned wind? wind sun time of day uh all of those for example you know if i'm flipping or or using any kind of plastics really a lot of times in the morning i'll use a darker color just because it's lower light uh, and as the day progresses or if the sun comes out or the clouds come out or um or even wind could dictate you know color uh if it's you know the clearer or calmer or brighter it is the more natural like green pumpkin colors did I'm gonna you do use. that yesterday and you follow where you yeah i did with my swim jig uh, i <laughs> started with a black and blue um and actually ended up you know i said i caught on a black and blue it was actually in the middle of the day i switched to a black blue green pumpkin mix uh, tramp stamp or 1099 or a couple examples of those colors but the top part's black and blue the bottom part's green pumpkin and i did put a different skirt on actually that had some green pumpkin in it as well nice It's a spot. So eh, we saw him hitting the surface, and I threw the uh, closest thing I got to a black buzz bait on, which is a a whopper plopper. plopper. Yep, really? I, I plopped him with the whopper, and uh, 
A lot of pauses and twitches. Just something nice about the um, the whopper plopper is that you can. I hear them busting somewhere else too. Where? I just I I heard it. I didn't see it, but you know. Oh, right. Nice looking spot. Right in, the, right in the corner of the mouth. Kept them on there. Beautiful spot. So another question is, what's what's the difference between what you do when you're pre-fishing as opposed to tournament fishing? How, do, how does it look? If someone were to, to see you in each of those modes, how are they different? Pre-fishing, a lot of times, I'm just trying to eliminate water and I'll just go down a bank if it looks good, if it looks bad, if it looks anything, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm going to fish all of it uh, more times than not, uh, unless I'm dialed into a specific pattern. But most times pre-fishing, I'm going through, uh, you know, assortment of lures. I'm retying a lot and I'm, uh, yeah, just covering as much water, trying to a lot of times just eliminate stuff. Uh, and come tournament time, you know, all that, I'm fishing only high percentage stuff. Uh, a lot of times I'll go back and forth on a bank a few times where in pre-fishing, you know, if I catch a fish on a stretch of bank, I'm just getting to a juicy looking spot and I catch one, you know, flipping a piece of wood and I see four more pieces of wood, uh, mo more times than not, I'm just gonna, gonna leave it alone, kind of skip that area and um, maybe, you know, pay attention for later in the day if I come across another area that looks similar to that. So sampling it as opposed to just pounding it to death. Yeah, exactly. Nice. All right, this next one comes from your team, fellow team torpedo uh, teammate, Jake Harshman. He, he, uh, I asked for questions and he gave me a couple. Um, his first one's as far as adversity in tournaments, like what you experienced at Kissimmee uh, this year, how do you adapt so well? I mean, how do you, how do you handle when, when bad I, stuff I, happens, whether it's in pre-fishing, in the in the tournament itself what's i definitely think i have an easier time letting go of for some reason i've kind of trained myself mentally like in tournaments to lot not let stuff get to me uh but pre-fishing and practice I mean, there's definitely times where if i get a string of bad events um it, it'll definitely get the best of me and kind of shake me up a little bit uh i can get, I can get frustrated you know and yeah but during the tournament i feel like recently i have had a, a done a better job of you know when something bad bad happens or if i lose a fish or something doesn't go my way or if somebody's in my spot um, of just kind of mentally blocking it out and and just stay in the moment and uh, i think that's a big part of you know why i've done well in the tournaments recently you can just shake it off i yeah. mean you're, you're pretty purposeful in deciding that you're yeah. gonna shake it off i wish i off. could transfer you know if that could just happen in pre-fishing too it'd probably be better for me but uh, like i said sometimes when it's just tournament mode uh, i kind of get like that sometimes that, that sort of you know being able to shake it off you see that in a lot of other top athletes in in sports where they make a boneheaded play that they don't they don't uh yeah, just staying composed. And yeah, they have a, where well, they say, you know, a short memory. So. Yeah. He's got a giant. Does he? Oh my goodness. That was so big. Did you see that? How big was that? Oh <laughs> you were distracted by it. <laughs> that was, I don't know if it was up. a spot or a large amount. I think jumped like two feet out of the water. Yeah. All right, let's get past these guys and okay. go catch our own. Do you you feel you're more of a power fisherman or a finesse fisherman? I definitely consider myself. I mean, I could do both, but I much prefer. You know, my strength is power fishing for sure. Just making accurate casts at targets and trying to cover water, you know, fast and efficiently, and uh, just hit as many of those ambush points as possible. Um, that's the way I prefer to fish. And um, yeah, just how many casts do you think you get in a day? Oh, do you ever quantify it? I've never, I've never tried to, to figure that out, but I mean, if I'm making cast every 10 seconds, that's what, six of, uh, what more than that, probably 10 a minute. So 600 an hour times what, 10, so 6,000 casts maybe if you're fishing 10 hours. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to film you and see what it is. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll just sample a couple minutes and see what, what that looks like. All right. Yeah. 
I like that. So when do you feel like wh when do you make the the call that you need to downshift from power fishing to finesse? Like what? A lot of it's like water clarity can play a big part. If the water's dirty, more times than not, or at least stained two feet, you know, two, two feet or less. We've uh, got that here. Oh yeah. So this is. I, I mean. If you have water of that color, you should be able to find some sort of power fishing bite, whether it's, you know, cast and reaction bite like this, or sometimes I even consider flipping power fishing, just hitting a bunch of targets, just hitting one target, flipping it, you know, shaking it a little bit, bringing it out. And sometimes I don't even do that. Sometimes I just sort of hit the bottom, take it out, and just hit as many targets as possible. Um, but so water clarity, I think, is the biggest factor. But you can power fish in clear water too. Here's another one from Jake. Is there a specific technique that you feel you can go anywhere in the country and catch fish within crunch time during a tournament? What is your go-to in tough times? Uh, my go-to is a swim jig just because of how, how versatile it is, how many different things you can do with it. Uh, but at the same time, there are lakes, you know, clear highland reservoirs where you can't really use a, a swim jig if the water's too clear. As long as the water's stained, if I had to pick one lure, uh, that would be it, I think. All right, so I'm gonna tie on, uh, it's one of my favorite swim jigs here. It's a 3 8 just white swim jig with a zoom. Um, super speed craw, not the ultra vibe speed craw. It's a little bit bigger, um, displaces a little bit more water. And I'm gonna throw this on 17 pound fluorocarbon with an I-Rod Genesis 3 stone cold swim jig um, rod. It's a seven foot two, medium heavy. And uh, I'm using 17 pound fluorocarbon line San Diego jam knot so the way I throw this is I'll throw it out and just shake that rod tip pretty violently sometimes I'll pause it and just pop 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 shake 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 usually I just shake it a lot uh, I'll fish this a lot for for spawners that I that I can't see sometimes the water's pretty dirty and they're spawning down in like two or three feet of water uh, this is a great, great swim jig for those spawners. Uh, like I said, sometimes just doing pop, 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 and just that slight hesitation uh, when it just drops down a second is what makes them react to it. First cast. <laughs> Bigger than the last one. It's like four and a half pounder. You said first cast on the... First cast on the Square bill. Let me see. I that was a good swirl. I, I had a, oh, I I had a good look it at it. It was like four and a half pounder. It was bigger than the last one. Nice. All right. I followed his lead. Oh, he's, oh, he's off. No. <laughs> yeah, that was a good fish. <laughs> how big you think he was? Oh my God! How big was that? I don't know. It was like five or six pounds or something, right? Yeah. I just lost a giant. Oh my doing goodness. exactly what he did throwing that crankbait this one was uh that was a big fish very similar looking bait but first first cast up into this yes that's a good spot right there they are gorging on, on bait fish. So Tim's found a school of spotted bass out in this current. I just watched him catch two. He said he had one following. That might be a good one. There's another. You hook up, just let him, let him fight a little bit. 
Because there'll be another one trying to take it away from Yeah, he's he's nice. He's a uh... good job. Yeah, there's a bunch of good ones here. That's a thick. Yeah, <laughs> Tim's got one just like it. Beautiful fish. Talk about networking with other anglers, alliances, if you will. Um, who do you who do you trust enough to share pattern, location, presentation information with? What makes that person trustworthy, and what do you get in return? Uh, yeah, having a group to to hang out with and travel with. A lot of times when I when I do these tournaments, you know, we'll we'll get an Airbnb for the week and get anywhere from you know sometimes just me and my buddy Adam sometimes about five or six of us and uh, it plays a big part and, and you know we all help each other out and you know it can kind of go both ways sometimes it really helps you and sometimes it can it can hurt you but you know most times I I really trust people until they give me a reason you know not to and uh, there's been several tournaments I, I can you know I can credit a friend for for tipping me off or pointing me in the the right direction, uh, you know, and that's led to to success in a, in a lot of the terms. I remember Broken Bow, uh, you know, me, Cody, and uh, and Matt. We were all uh, you know staying together, hanging out, and talking. And Josh Stewart too, actually, all four of us. And uh, you know, just by each of us giving a piece of information, a piece of the puzzle. Uh, a lot of times when you have all those pieces, you, you know, you can get the whole picture of what's going on and you can't do that unless, uh, you know, you have other people working with you sometimes. So Russ, you had the, you had pre-fishing earlier this week, the tournament yesterday, you're fishing with us today and tomorrow. At what, at what point do you kind of attack the whole gear maintenance? restocking all that stuff what what is your your procedure for uh for rebounding in terms of taking care of your gear after a tournament well, mo most of the stuff uh as far as all the real maintenance cleaning those all up and uh tying jigs and making make a lot of my own lures and tie my own jigs a lot of that i try to do in the winter time just because uh once spring does start it's just go 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 and sometimes you know i'll get low on a lure or i'll, I'll have to you know tie some jigs or uh do some maintenance work on my truck you know but between the tournaments uh but i really like to spend winter time just prep as much as i can and get all that that ready for the year but in terms of just wear and tear and just checking out your gear to make sure yeah, you're lot of, ready you know, for the there's next. always like the maintenance that you got to do on uh, you know on all your stuff you know whether it's checking your oil and changing your oil on your truck or even with the torpedo you know taking off the prop and checking it for for any kind of line or anything like that that's in there and um, I was putting WD-40 on the on the uh, the fittings there going to the battery and uh, that's just all kind of maintenance stuff and with everything there's always those maintenance things you got to stay on top of So tell me about your your personal best largemouth Where was that caught? What'd you get it on? Personal what presentation? Largemouth was, uh, it was in a tournament actually. It was in uh, Clear Lake at a uh, Railvac, a FLW Railvac tournament and it was on the first day and I Actually caught first thing in the morning. I catch an eight and a half pounder. I was using a jerk bait, uh, Lucky Craft Stacy, and then proceeding that eight and a half pounder, I caught two carp in the mouth with the jerk bait, and kept fishing. And then I hooked another fish, and it felt like another giant carp. And it actually ended up being uh, just over an eleven pound largemouth, and it was hooked with one treble hook on the side of the cheek and it came up to the boat made a run underneath the boat i remember I actually had to lift up the trolling motor and like bring my rod all the way around the front of the boat and it was just taken off it was a crazy fight it took me a while to get in I had a 10 pound test and uh yeah it was just over 11 pounds 
which was uh, yeah, it was a special moment, one I'll never forget for sure. Nice. So where do you think your your next per, next biggest personal best in the future is coming from? <laughs> what what fisheries kind of? You know, give me four have, fisheries where you think there that that could happen for you. I'll give you three states where it'll probably happen. Either uh, you know California. Texas or Florida uh, it seems like especially this year we have a lot of tournaments scheduled in Texas uh, and that's uh, they've been kicking giants out of there this year um, you know California when I go back home to visit I usually go at least once or twice a year I go to California and I'll end up fishing usually Clear Lake maybe the Delta so there's a good chance there uh, and it seems every winter for the last few years I've spent some time down in Florida fishing the Kissimmee chain so um, you know Florida especially that time of year is you have a good chance of getting your personal best. Russ is jumping up on the bow to see what kind of speed he can get. So we are back at the uh, Casa de Perkins, and I have Pearl here loving me up, <laughs> loving some attention. What kind of dog is she? Blue tick. Blue tick. Pretty dog. So, what what kind of distance do you think we did today? You you marked something on your on angler app. You did the angler app. I missed about the first half, and I. Uh, it said we did 9.1, so I estimated we did between 12 and 13 today. Okay. Based on when you clicked it clicked and started it. Clicked it to start it, yeah. Okay. And um, there at the end, Russ, you you were you were playing around with your the motor trying to, you were way forward on it. You are trying to get a top end speed. What did you end up getting? Uh, seven miles an hour. Okay. It's uh, 6.9, I think it read out. I do not get that fast in my attack once more. Neither do <laughs> I. I'm a little guy, so yeah. <laughs> maybe the weight has something but to do with it. But you're clearing seven. I did have it packed, I mean, loaded up pretty good. I had a lot of tackle in there. Yeah, that is cool. So, what are we getting into tomorrow? Just another, another similar river? river? Similar river. Uh, okay. You know, we, we put in at a creek today and went out into a river. Yeah. And the river we're going to do tomorrow is going to be comparatively size-wise between the creek and, and the big river we're in today. So okay. it'll be a kind of a medium, small Spots river. and largemouth again? Spots, largemouth, and striper. And striper. Bonus striper. Cool. Action. Very cool. Exciting. Could get a hold of a, you know, 30 or 40 inch striper tomorrow. Nice. That'd be great. So we'll see. All right. Well, let's get some rest. Well, get rest. Hope the rain holds off. Yeah. Oh, it won't. It'll pour. <laughs> That's all right. All right. all right. We've had some thunderstorms, and uh, it's it's not raining right now. So, in between the uh, the drops, I want you to show us. Just give us some insight on your your home life on the home. road, but but this this very unique vehicle that you've customized. You sleep in it. You have refrigeration. Y you got power to to. My torpedo battery? Yeah, Any everything. Battery, everything. Yeah. Everything. Show us. All right. Well, yeah, this is uh, my 04 GMC Sierra. Original owner. It has uh, 400,000 miles on it. <laughs> so, it's uh, yeah, it's treated me well. Did you say 400,000? Yeah, just over, actually. It was like four. It's actually like 430. Wow. But, uh, yeah, so this is it. Uh, did some customization. Took out the back seats. Took out the passenger seat. Um, built basically I wanted some storage boxes where I can lock stuff up uh, and be safe where you know people looked in and you couldn't see you know what was there really and uh, first step was uh, creating a power source so I have two of these 100 amp hour Dakota lithiums uh, with a power inverter and then I have a red arc DC to DC charger which uh, basically uses the alternator to bypass the truck battery once that's full and then charge up uh, my power source with the Dakota Lithiums here. And I also keep my fish finders and stuff like that, torpedo throttle, all of that in there. Um, and let's see, this is all kind of memory foam 
cushion right here. I still do put like a sleeping pad on top of it. This is where all my sleeping stuff is here. Pillow, blankets, and, and sleeping sleep, bag. And you fit sideways in this. I fit, yeah, just extend it out. And it's just because of, you know, these little cutouts right here. I made sure to make this box level with this. And it's just because of this and the other side that I'm able to lay out completely straight. Um, I would not fit. No, you wouldn't. No. <laughs> you could, I mean, yeah, you just have to be curled up a little bit. Uh, I got my paddle holder that I made, the bending branches paddle. That's a convenient way to, to store that. You can still see out the back window. Uh, this power source here also, uh, yeah, charges my Torquedo battery, my Dakota Lithium fish finder batteries, as well as uh, this refrigerator that I got here. And I like to do a lot of meal prep, cook a lot of my own food and bring it with me so I'm not having to eat out on the you know, at restaurants and stuff on the road so much. Talk to me about nutrition when you're when you're out on the water. Hydration, it, nutrition, how does that? It plays a big part, you know, just trying to stay healthy, stay energized, and, uh, you know, um, yeah, getting, getting as much sleep as possible and drinking as much water, uh, especially towards the end of a long day uh, when you're out on the water, and it's especially in the summertime when it gets really hot out. Um, just doing all those things play, play a big part. I really think it, you know, Taking care of your body definitely affects the, the mental side of things too. Yeah. It's been a great addition here. I used to have a cooler last year and I was just constantly having to, to get ice all the time. Sometimes I'd be 30 minutes from a gas station and all of a sudden I'd be out of ice and need to, you know, drive out of my way and do all that. So this, this is the Ice Co. Picked it up, uh, yeah, not Very too long cool. ago. It's been good. Keep my catch board right here, my Tacticam, uh, video camera, the Yak Attack stick. Right here, everything kind of has its own place. Uh, keep my little box, uh, waterproof box that I put under my seat for my phone keys and wallet for my kayak. Got my Torquedo battery. Got my Dakota 18 amp hour lithium battery. Uh, a thing of water. I put all my lures that I use really added up <laughs> from the Ufala tournament. It's just the whole week here, but I'll put all my lures there to, to dry out every day after I'm done using them and eventually put them back in their places. Um, this here is just uh, storage for, for tackle and my clothing. And then this here is just all of my chargers. I have a little fan that I run here to keep me cool uh, in the summer months. Uh, I store all that uh, in that box there. That just plugs right into the power source too. Nice. And uh, yeah, as we come around, I got a toolbox that I keep like uh, a camp stove, electric cords, some propane, and uh, I don't know, just a bunch, bunch of stuff like that. I uh, got two kayaks here. I have a Yakima, uh, Yakima Overhaul HD rack uh, with the, yeah, big catch um, yak holders right there. I also got a Yakima top water. Uh, for all my rod storage, so I don't have to keep that inside my truck. And yeah, also a Yakima long arm uh, bed extender here, which makes loading kayak, uh, getting it in and out a lot easier. And yeah, I have my Yak Attack, or my, my Warner Systems Attack 120, as well as my Pro Angler uh, 12. 360 and um, what else I got? I got a little place here to store my my boots. I dry my boots here. <laughs> Keep my water shoes, depending on if it's cold or warm, which one I'll use. Uh, that just stays there. That works out. And um, it's a very cool, unique rig. Thank you. It's worked out good for me. And uh, yeah, it's my my home away from home. And cool. Makes things a lot easier. Let's go get some breakfast Let's and, do it. and go hungry. catch some fish. All right. So we were talking yesterday about how you us lean towards the power fishing end of things, and, and it it pays off obviously. But you think of other notable kayak anglers in the sport who have that consistency. Someone like Kurt Smiths who. I know he leans towards finesse. Um, and then you have someone like Jody Queen who I think bounces back and forth between, I mean, you know, he power fishes in, in certain circumstances. And I'm not saying that you can't finesse, I know you can, but it's it's your, your natural, you know, 
it, it's where you're it's most comfortable. Go to, I'm going to go to that first, and if all yes. else fails, then I'll go to finesse. So how do you, you know, you're covering a lot of ground, and those guys, well, I'd say, you know, Kurt, like I know the national championship a couple years ago, he, he posted up, I think, on one spot and just was patient with him, let it reload. How do you reconcile the consistency in those two styles, and how do you, you know, which which is more consistent, and which is is I don't want to say which is better, but I don't know. There isn't that. I don't think one's better than the other. It's just what your preference is. I'm sure, like Kurt is really good at using his electronics, and he has like the pan optics. And, uh, in order to be a good fisher or finesse fisherman, those are the tools that you got to kind of utilize in order to have success at it. <clears throat> uh, just some I'm not as, as good at I can do it but like I said I'm I feel like my strength is is moving fast and doing accurate casts and recognizing those ambush points so I can be as efficient as possible keep my lure in the strike zone as much as possible as often as possible great what Go. What? What are your thoughts? I, I, would, got think, I would think it has to be with the time of year too. You know, uh, because early, early, uh, those fish are not going to be as active. So I would think that the slower presentations uh, would be more effective in those wintering type haunts. Uh, you know, where those fish are just kind of uh, lethargic, so to speak, with, with that finesse. Or that waiting game like uh, Kurt was doing was probably be better off and uh, a better technique than, than power fishing. Right. Definitely agree. But I think the downside of, of finesse is that you invest a lot of time. Well, it's going to make or break you. And, you. and you have to, it's you hard have to, to know you're on a spot that, that yeah. is going to reload with fish. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to pre-fish when you're fishing finesse unless you, you know, you just can't cover as much. Much Do you don't think those those spots that you identify in pre-fishing as as you know with power fishing will at certain times be susceptible to a finesse presentation? Like you, we went through a period of time yesterday where where you said I don't think they're they're eating the you know the buzz bait anymore. And yes, you switched to another power fishing presentation, which was the crank bait. But if if you're in the right spot. When you just say they're not, they're not smashing this. If you switch to, you know, a jig or a Seiko or something that's slower. Yeah, and there's plenty. Of, so there's plenty of times when I'm pre-fishing and I'm, I'm power fishing. I'm looking at my electronics, and there's times when I'm more just power fishing just to kind of look at my electronics. And even if they're not eating those faster moving lures, just a way to still throw something and kind of look at my graph. And maybe I'll get one. You know lucky bite on it and then then i'll just it'll tell me okay there's fish here and then i'll slow down and start doing more finesse stuff I, but i feel like there's tremendous power in in having the instinct or or urge to switch from finesse to power fishing or back or you know that knowing knowing when to say okay slow down and it, I think it's a really hard thing to do if you're fishing fast to, is to slow down well, and especially I think if you're, if you're and if you're getting bites that are sporadic in your finesse fishing to recognize that hey I need to speed it up and cover more ground because they are going to eat well I'll fall into this rut too we had this conversation I, I'll fall into this rut going in somewhere and, and pre-fish and, and know that there's fish there and then I automatically go in and I slow down. So I'm fishing history instead of letting that fish tell me what's going on that day. And I, I think a lot of guys fall into that rut right there. And I know that I fished myself out of tournaments by not being at that real quick pace, making uh, two casts for every other angler's one, and just slowing down in history fishing, so to speak. And uh, you know, that's the thing at Russ is, uh, that impresses me and there's a, there's, there's a couple others that stay in that top five is they're making three casts to most guys in one and they're moving and, and it is that instinctive thing that you got to have and a little bit of luck too but uh, you know we, we all tend to get into that history fishing rut too right so, and I, I'm guilty I'm bad guilty I tend to have more success too at lakes that I've never been to like yeah. history uh 
Yeah, it can hurt you for Sometimes sure. Sometimes it don't repeat itself. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it did it for you, didn't consume you though, you know? Yeah, that there are times where it has, but there's, more, you know, probably more times where it hasn't. That's not. I should have brought my walker. Yeah, we're back at the buzz bait. We're uh, New River, and we got a lot of rain overnight. It, what, or at least rain an inch or two. Uh, we are worried it might be blown out, but luckily, you know, there's a little bit of color to the water, but it's still totally fishable. It looks, looks really good, actually. Can you go over your steering on this commander? I have a, uh, it's a stick shift. It's got a cable on it. Yep. And uh, my buddy Trey uh, fixed me a little connector back there. And I can move it right and left this way. There's no feedback. So once I get it going, I actually can stand up and fish out of this thing. Nice. And uh, my, my throttle's on the other side over here. So. Give me some steering. Nice. Bad one, biggest one of the day. Nice man. Nice going. Got him on the goat. The Z Man goat? Yeah. Beautiful. Spin it around here. Nice this going. Texas man. rig. I missed it the first time. It's just sitting right there on a tree stump. Close to three pounds though. Nice. Big old river spot. See how long he is. Eighteen and a half. All right. All right, where was she? I was sitting right there on that log. I was actually kind of this area looked a lot of it looked the same, so I just wanted to fly up river until I hit a river bend or something. Uh, and I saw this one tree that was just sticking out a little farther than the rest. Uh, had a big old root system on it, which was creating an eddy. So just decided to make a cast on it. Uh, and I, I just picked up this goat here. I've been using a lot of reaction baits and was like, oh, I'll try flipping a little bit. Uh, made a cast with it. Something slammed it. I set the hook. My drag was loose. So I turned back around, made another couple casts, and it came back and got it. Nice, man. Oh, Tim's got one off that tree, too. Ran into a few, maybe. Nice, Tim. I got him. <laughs> yes, my buddy's looking out for us. Um, there's a uh, tornado watch in our area. You got some serious thunderstorms coming on uh, this area. 
I can hear hear them in the distance. In the distance, it says we got within like a sixty minute window. And we're about we're gonna be pushing it getting back. So, time to zoom. Time to zoom. Okay, let's zoom. Zoom, zoom. All right, we made it up that hellacious hill. <laughs> <laughs> a little mud our pants, but a little uh, bit. at least I didn't fall this time. <laughs> Guys, I appreciate your time. It's it's been a fun couple days out here. Uh, and, uh, Russ, where are you? What are you headed to next? What's your next event? Next tournament's Lake Hartwell. Okay. Uh, a couple weeks, the Hobie. Yep. Uh, looking forward to it. Cool. For now, and Tim. Lake what are you Hartwell. Doing next? You're Hartwell. doing it. Mm -hmm. I'll see you up there. See you up there. All right. Thanks, guys. Yes. See you.